Well, hello again. Uh, I was just thinking as I walked in, if this drought would only end, we'd get a bigger crowd. One thing I want you to know, this isn't personal with me. As a matter of fact, I came here ready actually to believe what Mr. Hayfley presented. It's called being open-minded, and we're going to be judged by God's word, not our opinion. And I think you ought to be the same way. Uh, I think when what matters is the truth. It's not winning. It's not personality. It's not pride. You can learn and grow. And this is not just an academic pursuit. I mean, you could say well, this is a fine debate, and we had a good time listening. But life and death matter. Our eternal destinies are at stake. So you might feel personally close to Mr. Hayfley and loyal to him. You might um, feel that way. But your loyalty ought to be to Christ and his word. You may want him to, to get me, and that makes you feel good if he does that. Don't let that hinder you. Now, my proposition, he just read it, and it's pretty self-explanatory. And since, you know, we, you've been reminded this week you're intelligent, uh, I think you'll know what it means. So let's go to 220. What is this debate about? Well... Here's what the Bible says. This is what Mr. Hayfley says. Christ saves from all sin, past, present, and future. Hebrews 10, 10, and 14. Um, all sin, past, present, and future of all believers. Mr. Hayfley, baptism saves from past sins only. Christ is stronger than sin. You can't get out of his hand. John 10, 27 through 29. Mr. Hayfley, sin is stronger than Christ. It takes you out of his hand. Uh, what the Bible says, Christ always saves from sin's power. Romans 6.14, for sin should not have dominion over you if you're under the law, but under grace. Christ fails to save from sin's power. Uh, 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 2, Christ is your advocate when you sin. Mr. Hafley, one sin and you have no advocate. You don't have an advocate the time you need him. The Bible, the Father gives the elect to the Son as an irrevocable gift. That's over and over again in Scripture. I'm sure Mr. Hayfley tonight will try to remind us of uh, Judas, who was not an irrevocable gift from the Father to the Son. We're reminded of that several times in Scripture. But much of the Father's gift is revoked or lost or comes up missing, according to him. John 17, Christ's prayer that all believers are saved is answered, because none of Christ's prayers are not going to be answered. Christ's prayer is not answered, though, Mr. Hayfley. I'm sure you'll remind us that Judas or something like in the garden, something like that, you know, that Jesus prayed a prayer there and certain prayers that Jesus prayed wouldn't be answered, something like that. But uh, that's against the promises of God and against what the Bible says about the nature of Jesus Christ. God's promise to save unbelievers is true. God's promises to save unbelievers are false. Next. Justified by Christ's perfect righteousness through faith rejects justification, stand before God in our righteousness, which is filthy rags. The Bible, Christ's cross work saves, our work save, and I'm not sure whether they do or not. 221, actually 205. All right, I'd like to give you a little review. Some of you haven't been here on the debate. These are Mr. Hafley's lose it passages, so lose your salvation passages. He went through, like Galatians 5, Revelation 22, 1 Corinthians 6, etc., a list of sins. I said, such were, but now we're washed, we're justified. The sinning in the verses is continuous. It's not a one sin kind of thing, not one time. It's people that continuously sin that are actually sent to hell. Um, that is exactly like Mr. Hafley's chart on 1 John 3, 6-9. through 9. His chart actually said that. We'll go back to that later. And if you do continuously sin, you didn't lose it, but you didn't have it in the first place. 1 John 2.19, 1 John 3.6, among other places. The Bible doesn't teach you can lose it. It says you never had it in the first place. He gave a book of life argument, Revelation 22.19. I said it was perspective. It's part in the book of life, just like in the holy city. Uh, Mr. Hafley leaves out Revelation 17.8, showing that the elect are in the book of life from the foundation of the world. He didn't have that verse in his book of life uh, references. All right, Revelation 3, 5, or he's, Exodus 32 is... He says it's the book of life when it's actually speaking of physical life in that passage. So he's taking that out of context. Revelation 3, 5 promises the born of God cannot be blotted from it. So it's a promise that the, the saved can't be blotted from the book of life. And he never asked, answered this question, who was taken from the holy city? Because if they're taken from the book of life, their name, then they also have to be taken from the holy city, just to be consistent with the verse. Next. 
Hebrews 10, 20, 29 was one of his passages. I said, these are not saved people, but unsaved Jews, apostates who had not, never been saved, sanctified as being set apart racially by animal sacrifices, like Israel was set apart. This is a mixed crowd, and the lost are being warned. We looked at verses 38 and 39. 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22 he used. These are apostates who were never saved, just received knowledge from which they turned from. These apostates were those about whom the audience of 2 Peter was being warned, the scoffers of 2 Peter 3. Ezekiel 33 went too briefly. I said Ezekiel teaches eternal, eternal security. I gave a verse for that. The righteous is not a term always describing say people in every case in Ezekiel and other places in the Bible. Next, Galatians 5, 1 through 4 was one of his lose it passages. I said it's a mixed audience. Those described in Galatians 1, 7 through 9, by the way, a text that he left out of his presentation. He won't include that in because it didn't go with his view. Are unsaved. The justified by works and those adding circumcision are fallen from grace. Fallen from a position not in Christ, as opposed to Mr. Hafley's on Christ view. Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Hafley's lose it passages. Axiomatic law of sowing and reaping. The unbeliever sows to the flesh and the believer sows sow to the spirit. Romans 8, 12, and 13. After the flesh are lost, after the spirit are saved, answer the corollary, John 3, 18, 2. Condemned doesn't mean dead. It means waiting for punishment. Jude 1, 5. Physical deliverance of unbelieving Israelites. It's not spiritual salvation there. Hebrews 3. Holy brethren versus brethren. Mixed multitude warning passages in Hebrews to unbelieving Jews. Next. Revelation 3, 16. Spew the out argument. Uh, spew the out as a metaphor describing God's distaste in light of warm springs around Laodicea. I also believe those people that were lukewarm were unsaved. Jesus wouldn't welcome Jesus into their, into their life, into their church. John 15, 5 and 6, uh, a metaphor describing saved and unsaved people. Saved people abide in him and unsaved people do not abide in him. No loss of salvation pictured. John 2 and 6, he gave those two and I had mentioned those as well. Dead faith, intellectual belief, only professing disciples. Um, he said God elected nationally as a group. I gave three specific examples of individual election. Rufus in Romans 16, 13. There was no answer from Hafley. Luke 12 parable. This is the one that I did not answer as I went through everything. Next slide. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidservants, and eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. The faithful servant is the saved person, the unfaithful servant is the unsaved, unbelieving person. This says nothing about losing one's salvation. Next. This is one of his pet arguments. They be, he'll say they believe that a saved person can sin, has committed adultery and murder once or more as much as he wants and still be saved. We don't. Justified or redeemed people will not live sin as a lifestyle. Next. Um, so that's one, actually we have to go to, two, uh, back to 209, 210. 210. All right, so Brandenburg's passage on internal security. I actually, even though I was in the rebuttal, gave him some passages on eternal security. Whoso believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, 1 John 5, 1. I ask if the person who is about to be baptized in, in the church of Christ believes that Jesus is the Christ. If not, then why are you baptizing him? If so, then he's also already a child of God. He didn't answer the question. He instead asked me a question. The person you led in a prayer for salvation, would they already believe this? Problem. Brandenburg nor the Bible says salvation is praying a prayer. So basically that was another straw man. I never said that salvation was praying a prayer. He says if you pray a prayer with them for salvation, I don't say salvation is praying a prayer. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, loss of rewards, not loss of salvation, um, I say. He says work is people and those people will be burned. Hafley does not answer, so is by fire. Matter of fact, even when he quotes it, he leaves it out. He actually leaves that part out when he quotes it. No existence of rewards for him. I gave the perfect tense used for eternal security in several passages. Answer, none. Next. Hebrews 12, disobedient believers are chastised by God, and it doesn't work only with unbelievers. Unbelievers it doesn't work with. Believers it does work with. And if it doesn't work with them, they're dead. Sick or dead, we saw in 1 Corinthians 11. Sometimes chastisement doesn't work. He quotes Proverbs 29.1 that uses the word reproveth, not chastise. And this is an unbeliever anyway, which would prove the Brandenburg point. It doesn't even have the word chastise in there. It says reproveth, but he read it like it was for chastisement, his view on chastisement. 
Romans 8, 35 through 39, nothing can separate believers from the love of God. His answer, these are only those who love him. The text, however, says that these are those that love him. That's who it's talking about. The same that are justified and glorified in verses 29 and 30. So it is saved people that he's talking about. Nothing can separate them from the love of God. Next. Ten minutes. Here are some questions. Actually, that, that wasn't it. I must have the wrong. Give, give me 212. Two, I left 212 out, I think. Okay. Um, and this is crucial. It's a good thing I put it back up. Okay, Mr. Hafley, when he stood up for his last speech, said, I never had it so easy in my life. I've just been sitting over there, and I just, it's, been, it's just been easy. I just, I, no, I just, it's the easiest thing I've ever done. So if it's so easy, why didn't you answer my arguments for John 10, 27 through 29, if it's so easy? John 17, 11, he didn't answer that. 1 John 5, 1 and 4, his answer was this. Children of Satan can become born again, so children of God can be unborn again. John 4, 13 and 14. Israelites drank of Christ in the wilderness. That was his answer. For drink and you'll never thirst. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Are they who justified also glorified? No answer. 1 John 3, 6. Hath not seen nor known. No answer. 1 John 2, 19. He adds changing in his explanation. Puts that word. It's not in the verse. I think when scripture speaks, we speak. And when it's silent, we should be silent leaves out if they had been of us in his explanation. The crucial part he leaves out in his explanation. Okay, now go to uh, the questions. Okay. I've got questions for Mr. Hafley. I'm not going to elaborate because I don't want to take up all my time. But I'm asking him to answer these questions. I answered his the other night. Does someone who, who you are about to baptize in a Church of Christ baptistry love God? Yes or no? It's a pretty easy question. It doesn't have like the unborn and a whole bunch of scriptural, unscriptural things in it. Um, according to Matthew 18, 15 through 7, does a saved person go and tell another saved person alone when that same person has trespassed against him by stealing from him? Yes or no? Number three, is a man who gets chastened for lying a saved person? Yes or no? Are all who are justified also glorified? Yes or no? Does Jesus ever do something not in the Father's will? Yes or no? All right, next. Those are my questions. We'll see if he answers them. He can step up to the lick log. All right? This is the Hafley twist. All right? Mr. Hafley makes passages written to a mixed crowd into an only saved crowd. You need to watch out for it. Unsaved people were in the midst of these people. Number two, Mr. Hafley uses conditional sentences and implies things that are not there. It tells you that you can see them because you are intelligent. Every time he tells you that you're intelligent, look out. Okay? Mr. Hafley ignores the immense number of passages that clearly say that salvation is permanent, can't be lost. Okay? Mr. Hafley ignores the tenses, time and action of the verbs when it's convenient for him. And number five, Mr. Hafley covers for these mistakes or problems with rhetorical stunts and antics. Next. The issue of conditional sentences. If clauses. Implications come from conditional sentences. Implications are not statements. In other words, just because it's implied, just because it's, a condi it's conditional, means there might be an implication there, but that doesn't mean that that's the implication. Doctrine should not come from implication, and especially implication which is not existent. If clauses challenge professors to examine whether they be in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Next. Passages which show that true believers must persevere to the end. We have no problem with that. There are passages that show that. He's shown some of them. Some of these he's shown himself. He mentioned this one. He mentioned this one at least. I've seen these two in his material. Passages which teach that true believers will persevere to the end, though. So believers will persevere. They must persevere, yes. They're told to persevere, but they also will persevere. Next. They must persevere. Here are the verses. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. One of the things Mr. Hafley would say is, well, it says if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. So that means if you forsake him, you're going to lose your salvation, right? No, you're never saved in the first place. But it is telling you that you must persevere. If you don't, you weren't a believer. You were never saved in the first place. 1 John 2, 19. 1 John 3, 6. I showed you the passages. Some of, some of you are kind of looking around now like, uh, 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 I don't believe that. No, listen. 1 John 2, 19. 1 John 3, 6. Those passages have not been answered. Okay? Well, there was an answer given to the one of them, but 
Uh, you're just going to have to take a look at that. Um, so, verses like this, Colossians 1, 21 through 23, it says, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. One thing he won't tell you, by the way, on this verse, is that that's a first class conditional. It's a condition of reality. In other words, the idea is, since you continue in the faith. In other words, believers will continue in the faith. That's the understanding of it. It's translated it, but there are four conditions in the, in the Greek language. This is a first class conditional. He might make a big deal about, oh, Greek, oh, you guys need to, oh, we can understand that on our own, or something like that. But that's what it's saying. It was written in Greek. Hebrews 3.14, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. This is a passage, as I said before, with the if clauses, the, the conditional sentences, that this is to challenge believers to examine themselves whether they be in the faith. Okay? Jude 1.21, keep yourselves, must persevere. Next. Will persevere. These verses say that. Of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Them he also justified, and he justified. Them he also glorified. They will persevere. That he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. Here, they would no doubt have continued with us. And then verse 27, ye shall abide in him. If they are saved, they would no doubt have continued with us. They will persevere. Ye shall abide in him. Those are promises to the believer. They will persevere. Okay? Next. Here's, you, here you can see it. How much? Four minutes. Here you can see it in one verse. You must persevere. Work out your own salvation. You will persevere, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see both in the same verse. Next. If statements... Some more, and I'm, I'm not going to get into those. Just pass by those. I think people got it. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. This is Penultra to Christ in the Marketplace publication last month. So where do the scriptures say born of the devil or born of Satan? Why not silence on that? Are you going to be consistent here? Are we going to be consistent? You know if you're not being open-minded, if you're going to be inconsistent on that simple thing. If you won't do that, you didn't come here to listen and learn. Because the Bible doesn't say born of, of the devil. You're not ready to listen. If you, you, take, you say you believe this, but you will, will apply it right here. Implications are silent. Statements speak. Why not silence on your implications of conditional sentences and instead go to statements of scripture? Implications don't make statements about things. They don't make statements. Conditional sentences don't make statements. There's no implication in them. Okay? you got to go with statements. Next. Here's the issue, it's sin after salvation. Scriptural salvation removes sin before and after salvation. Go to Hebrews 10, 10 and 14, go to 175. Okay, here's to verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10, 10. The act of sanctifying is completed in the past with the results of that sanctifying ongoing. This is a perfect tense. The sanctification, and this is a saved sanctification. You'll probably bring up, oh, it's not always saved, Mr. Brandenburg. So it was it sanctified, saved here now? Something like that. It's obvious here this is sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. So this is salvation, okay? Uh, so, sanctification is completed with the results ongoing. In other words, it's into the future. Sanctification goes. Next. Here's another one. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. The act of perfecting is completed at one point in the past with the results ongoing. The results of the perfection are ongoing. Next. Okay, so then 1 John 1, 5 and 2, 2. Scriptural salvation removes sin before and after salvation. How does it happen? Well, we have the advocacy of Jesus Christ. Go to the 134. Okay, you can see here in these verses, and I'll just go down here to verse 2. Uh, verse 1, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he's an advocate when you sin. He's an advocate for believers. Mr. Hafley will say, well, is he? He'll say something like, is it propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the world? Is it propitiation for the sins of the whole world? Then, and that's just a cloud. That's just smoke screen. That's all it is. He's an advocate only for the people that are saved. That's who he's an advocate for. He may be a propitiation for everyone, but he's only an advocate for saved people. All right? Um, even though the Lord Jesus Christ provided a propitiation for the sins of the whole world, he's an advocate for the believer when he sins, which he will, cleansing him all of all of his sins. 1 John was written to believers to give them assurance of salvation. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So the believer gets assurance by seeing certain qualities in his life that will characterize someone born of God. It's not a matter of losing your salvation. It's a matter of seeing these characteristics and knowing that you're saved. The believer is someone who characteristically, uh, as a lifestyle, practices, walks in, in the light. 
People may say they have fellowship with them, but if they walk in darkness, they're lying. The people that are sinning are lying. They're not saved, okay? People have fellowship with them. Walk in the light because he is light. People that walk in the light have fellowship with him and receive the cleansing from the blood of Christ. What sin causes a person to lose his salvation? Sin, any sin, falls short of the perfect holiness of God. Okay? We'll get to that. We'll come back to that. I'm an affirmation tonight. Gentlemen moderators, Mr. Brandenburg, brothers and sisters in Christ, and ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Brandenburg reminded us that we should be open-minded, that souls were at stake. But since most of the audience here tonight believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, I wonder how souls could be at stake. I'll just let that fly by you. At any rate, I want to ask my opponent some questions. Chart number... I have 172 and 173. That can't be right. What our question chart? Hmm? 272, is it? Do you need to show us some charts to you there? Yeah, 272, maybe. Try 272. And yeah, back it up. That's it. Back it up. Right there, there they were. All right. When God makes an everlasting promise, a promise with con uh, everlasting consequences, can it be overturned by man failing to keep certain conditions? Number two, since you say a Jew is counting the animal blood of the Old Testament an unholy thing in Hebrews 10, 29, what is the sore punishment that is worse than death? Number three, did Israel have the city of Jericho in their immediate possession the very moment God said, I have given into thine hand Jericho? Number four, how many sins can a child of God commit from idolatry to murder so long as it's not characteristic or lifestyle and continue to be saved? Number five, since you say, Mr. Brandenburg, the disciples were an irrevocable gift of God to Jesus, and Jesus prayed for God to keep them, will Judas be saved eternally? And I'd like my opponent to pay his respects to those questions and answer as he has not done in the, in the days past. I will answer his questions. Does someone whom you're about to baptize in a Church of Christ baptistry love God? Yes or no, he wants to know. Well, first, it wouldn't matter whether or not it was in a baptistry in a building. It might be a creek or somewhere else. <laughs> wouldn't make any difference where that was. Didn't have to be limited to that. But I will answer your question as Jesus answered the question of the Pharisees. And that is, does someone that you're about to say the sinner's prayer with love God? He said, oh, I didn't say. I didn't say that saying a prayer and all of that was essential have a tract written here by Mr. Kent Brandenburg and he says here is how, this is the manner, here is how you should call upon the Lord to save you. Lord I know I am a sinner, this time he's not saved. I confess that I've been trusting myself to keep my salvation, I know I'm kept by the power of God and he goes on and then he says right now I believe in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, not in my works or church or baptism my parentage but in Jesus Christ alone Please save me, Lord. So he's not saved yet. Please come into my life and take control. Amen. Now, Mr. Brandenburg, does your man love God when he says that prayer? When you answer that question, you'll have the answer to yours. Chart number 200. Uh, well, okay. Let me answer. How many sins can a child of God... Okay. Um, okay, how many sins can a child of God commit? I already read those, didn't I? Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were... Okay, 286, all right, sorry. Technology is nice if it falls into place. The book of God says that those that believe are born of God, those that love are born of God, and those that do righteousness are born of God. I believe, Mr. Vandenberg... That to be born of God, one must believe in God, one must love God, and one must do righteousness. It takes all three to be born of God. My opponent wants to stop at believing, but Mr. Brandenburg, let me ask you. Last, uh, last year, Mr. Ross argued that 
that Cornelius was saved because he received the Spirit and he believed and things like that. And he argues that in his works. And I wonder, did Cornelius love God before he believed in Christ? He was a devout man, one that feared God. Did he love God or did he hate God? Did God give the Spirit to a man that hated him? When you answer the question, you'll have your answer then. All right. And then, according to Matthew 18, 15 to 17, does a saved person go and tell another saved person alone when that same person has trespassed against him by stealing from him? No, he goes to an erring brother. He goes to an erring brother. And would you say that the man who has stolen is saved? If you say the stealer, the thief, can be saved, are you not agreeing with Sam Morris? That all the sins a man may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger, see? Are you saying he is saved? That the thief is saved? I say he's an erring brother who needs to confess and repent. And so I bring him the knowledge that he's stolen from me and I go to him. And so I correct him on that basis. And then he said, are all who are justified also glorified? Yes, as per the text cited, Romans 8, 29 and 30. But let me show you something about that text, ladies and gentlemen. Turn to Romans chapter 8. And you notice, please, that there's more to it than verses 29 and 30. Romans 8 begins with verse 28. And it says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. All right, now who is it that loves God? If you love me, keep my commandments. And so it is the one that keeps the commandments that loves God. That's the lover of God, my friend. And so the, the promise is made to those that love him. That's the one to whom those promises in verses 29 and 30 are made. But you say, no, doesn't make any difference. He's, he's called them, and so therefore they are saved eternally. There is a little verse 28 there in your way, sir, and you need to notice that, please. Then he said, did Jesus ever do something not in the Father's will? No, Jesus never did anything that was not in harmony with the Father's will. But Mr. Brandenburg, not everything that is the Father's will comes to pass. Did you know that? Art thou a teacher and, don't, and knowest not that? Notice, please, it is the will of God that all men should be saved. He'll have all men to be saved. That's God's will. But not every man will be saved. It's his will that all should come to repentance. But not all are going to come to repentance. So not everything the Father wills is going to occur. So just keep that in mind as you respond and reply. And then he came to number three. Okay, I'm sorry. Is a man, I missed question number three. Is a man who gets chastened for lying a saved person? No, he is an erring brother. As the Bible talks about, you reprove that brother and you chastise him yourself. You go to him and you talk to him and you make known his error, but you treat him not as an enemy, but as a brother. For example, 2 Thessalonians 3.15, the one to be withdrawn from. And if any of you do err from the truth, and you take that brother, that brother, and if any man do err from the truth, here's a brother that errs from the truth. He's an erring brother, has erred from the truth. James 5 and verse 19. And so I hope that will satisfy along that line. And then we move quickly here as he did. He cited Hebrews 10 at the very outset, but made no argument. No argument at all. Chart number 150. He made no argument at all. But notice please that here we simply have as the chart indicates, you simply have where the Old Testament priests sacrificed daily and how that conscience of sin remained because animal blood could not take away sins. But Christ's sacrifice is once for all, one time for all time. Now their sacrifices were daily. Now how we receive its benefits is not stated and not at issue in this text. The context though demands faithfulness. Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast our profession without wavering. And we'll come to the chart in Hebrews 10 in a moment. Cast not away therefore your confidence. Now Mr. Brandenburg says you can't cast it away. Then why did the Lord say cast not away your confidence? You have confidence and you can cast it away. And so I believe you can note the truth along that line. You have need of steadfastness. Well why? Why do you have need of steadfastness if once you're saved you're always saved? And verse 38 and 39 says, some draw back under perdition. Now, we're not of those, but some draw back to perdition. Wait a minute. 
Wait a minute, Mr. Vandenberg. If they were never saved, how do they draw back under partition? Huh? How do you draw back from a place that you've never left? You see that? Now, Mr. Vandenberg, surely you can beat that. And then he came to John 10 and said, Mr. Hayfley made no response. Well, Mr. Vandenberg, if you'll remember, you, I was in the affirmative. You were in the negative. I never introduced John 10. And you introduced it in the very last speech Monday night. I had no reply. You introduced it in the last speech last night. I had no reply. I was not in the negative, sir. It was not my duty so to respond. You make your argument on John 10. And I guarantee you, we'll give you a snoot fool. And then he came to John 17. And he said, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a prayer with Jesus' prayer. He said, Jesus' prayers are always answered. Well, folks and friends, get your Bible. I want you to look. He said, well, Mr. Afer, will say something about Judah. No, I won't. I'll let Jesus say it. You got your book? In John 17, why would you go to an English class without an English book? You don't go to history class without a history book. Now, we got our Bible. In John 17, Jesus in his prayer to the Father. He said he was no more in the world, and he said, I'm going to leave the world. And he said, uh, to, as he prayed, for those that thou, verse 9, I'm praying for those thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now look at verse 12. While I was with them, he's praying for those that God gave him. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, verse 12, I have kept. The ones that God gave him, Jesus said, I kept, and not a one of them, not a one, none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. You see that? That it might be fulfilled which is written in the Bible, in the scriptures. And so one of them was lost. That's what scripture says. Now, Mr. Brandenburg can make his own pass at that as he will. Then he came to Isaiah 64, 6 and made no argument. Chart 233. Now, Mr. Brandenburg, when you get ready to make your argument on Isaiah 64, 6, we're ready for you. But here it is on the record. No, our righteousness is not as filthy rags. The reason that their righteousness was as filthy rags was because of their iniquities. But now notice, folks, God does not deny righteousness. He looks for it. And the book says, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. You can, you can disdain that all you want, but that's what God's book says. So you make your argument, sir. Chart 46, he came and ran down all of my arguments, and we're glad for him to do it. Now notice some names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and those names are written there, but look at Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Well, what's the implication? If you do not overcome, what will happen? If one does not overcome, his name will be blotted out. Now, if any man takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. He couldn't take out what was never in there. So here's a man who's in the book of life, and God said, I'll take your part out. He said, that's impossible. Well, the Holy Scripture says that nothing's going to enter into that holy city. Anything that defileth the work of the abomination or maketh a lie, by the way, or steals either. And, but they which are written in the Lamb's book, of, only those written in the Lamb's book of life are going to enter that holy city. And if your name is not written there, you're cast into the lake of fire. But your name can be blotted out, chart 245. He mentioned again for us, and we thank him for it. He that despised Moses' law, listen, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That's what happened back yonder in the Old Bible, in the Old Testament. Now then, switching to the new, he says, of how much sorrow, how much worse punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who had done three things, trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. And Mr. Brandenburg has already told us that is the blood of the New Testament from Hebrews 10, 14. Because in Hebrews 10, 14, they were sanctified, perfected forever, them that are sanctified, sir. So there's your sanctification link, 10, 14 to 10, 29. You can't get around that. That'll be there when this world is on fire, sir. And so you can't make that the Old Testament blood. No, sir, that's the Son of God and the blood of the New Covenant. Verse 14 being witness there too. And when a man has done that, and by the way, he did despite to the Spirit of grace, not to the Spirit of the law. Thank you very much for bringing that up, Mr. Brandenburg. I hadn't intended to do it again, but thank you. Then he came to chart 57. 
He brought out my material in chart 57. They escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They were again entangled. How could you be again entangled, Mr. Brandenburg, if you never were saved to begin with? He argued here for 20 minutes, if you lose it, why well, you never were saved. How could you be again entangled and overcome if you'd never been disentangled? Chart number 69. He said, not all the righteous are saved. You want to read this passage with me, ladies and gentlemen? Jesus said, when I say to the righteous, he shall surely live. If he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, he shall die. Now, wait a minute. You mean he never was saved? Well, then how in the world could he die for this, Mr. Brandenburg? You say he never was saved to begin with. That's what you say. You said to the reference to Ezekiel 33, none of those said being righteous didn't mean they were saved. Well, how in the world could they die for something when they were already dead in their sins, sir? Five minutes. All right. Chart number... 238, he came to Galatians. And we notice, for folks and friends, you notice it, Christ made us free. How could you be again entangled therein? How could you be again entangled if you'd never been disentangled? He said they never were saved. Christ shall profit you nothing. Well, how could he profit them nothing? He shall profit you nothing. That indicates he was profiting them something. Look at verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you be justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. I believe this audience can see that. Don't let him try to smear you with that. Now, were, the, were, these, were these saved? Chart 225. Get your Bible, go to Galatians 1. Christ died for them. God called them into the grace of Christ. Justified by faith, not works. And Mr. Ross argued for four nights this week last year that these folks here were all one in Christ and had been saved. And he argued that from beginning to end. These were saved folks. But he goes, Mr. Brandenburg does, he hoped you wouldn't notice it. But in Galatians chapter 1, he says, oh, but here's some folks that weren't saved. I agree with that. Look at Galatians 1, 7. Some would pervert the gospel of Christ. Obviously, yes, some would which is not another, to be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Yes, there are some, verses 6 and 7, that would pervert the gospel. And those folks are not saved. They're trying to pervert the gospel. And Paul says to the saved, don't follow them. This man says, well, you never, none of you never were saved to begin with. Oh, yes, they were saved, sir. You didn't notice, please, that right below where it says he's become of no effect, which means he was of some effect, ye are fallen from grace. In verse 7 he said, you did run well. Talk about what Mr. Hafley didn't notice. He hadn't shaken and nodded one time like he'd ever dealt with that passage, neither. Three minutes. And he was in the negative. Chart number 162. And he said, well, you know, these folks in Jude, they never were saved and all of that. All right, now watch it, please. The opponent says, if you're lost, you never were saved. Mr. Brandenburg, what passage says that? The unbeliever is condemned already, John 3, 18. If the unbeliever becomes a believer and is saved, was he never an unbeliever? You see the twist on that? You see, he says if you're a believer and then you do something wrong, mess up, then you never were saved. Well, if an unbeliever is saved, was he never lost? <laughs> see, I will therefore put your memories, Jude said. That the Lord having saved the people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed them, they believed not. Were they never saved out of Egypt when they fell? In Galatians 6, 1, how do you restore somebody? And then uh, if they'd ever, why restore somebody? You can't restore anybody according to you. And he said he didn't say a prayer, and we've dealt with that, because he doesn't have a prayer on that one. Chart number 210. The faithful and wise steward. Now remember, this is the servant of the Lord. And the Lord says, who is that faithful and wise steward? He didn't make an argument. He just hoped you wouldn't notice and I wouldn't point it out. This fellow never was saved. Well, now wait a minute, friends. The Lord's servant is judged and condemned. Watch it now. And he said, I will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Folks, he's not an unbeliever. But he's going to have his portion pointed with the unbeliever. So that shows he is a believer. See? Now, I asked him last night, he wouldn't answer, said it's hypothetical and all that. What is, the, what is the lot, what is the portion of the unbeliever? I believe you can see that. He doesn't believe you can. 
Chart 87. It comes to 1 Corinthians 3.15. Folks, any teacher builds on the foundation. And when that, when that foundation is there, that's Christ, that is solid, it is unshakable. One minute. But those fall away, they'll be burned. That's a sign of apostasy. They were in Christ, but they'll be burned. And your salvation will be yet so as by fire in the figure there. That's all that is. And he never dealt with 1 Corinthians 3.17 to which I led him. He said, I didn't deal with John 10, and I dealt with that. And chart number 93. And um, I believe we dealt with those, with those conditions. All right. Um, and finally, he came to 1 John 5.13. Let him make the argument. He just threw some of these up there and hoped it'd stick. He didn't make an argument. I want you to notice 1 John 5.13, he cited the last thing he said. He said, I wrote to those that, that you may know you have eternal life. Yes, but you know what is necessary to know you have eternal life in that passage? It is that to you that believe on the name of the Son of God. But a man may cease to believe. Time. All right, John 10, I talked about two times. He hasn't answered it. John 17, 11, um, essentially, uh, this was in one of our questions, um, and that was about um, whether Jesus ever does something that's not in the Father's will. And he says sometimes, that's about all he said on it, as far as John 17. And I think he had the Judas, the Judas, Thing, which actually in the text, when you look in the text in John 17, it never ever says anywhere in there that Jesus, the, uh, that the Father gave Judas to Jesus, or that Jesus gave Judas to the Father. Never ever says that. Never ever says it in the text. So that's another implication in which he's speaking where Scripture is silent. All right? Um, John 4, he's still not answered. Uh, Romans 8, 29, 30, that was not an answer. He didn't answer whether the justified were glorified. 1 John 2, 19, he, he, had, he, he put a, a question up there um, that said he still hasn't told me that they can't lose it, that there's a passage. Yeah, 1 John 2, 19, we went over it sufficiently, and also we went over it in 1 John 3, 6, but he never answered those. He's just saying that, that I never did it. 180. Okay, going back to his questions, um, in 1 John 5, 1, it says, He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God is born of God. Okay? That's what we believe salvation is. The moment he believes, it's not a prayer that's prayed. Okay? He can, he can pull out whatever information he wants to read, take things out of context, but that's the belief. Debate what we've got going tonight. I, I showed the verse, 1 John 5, 1. He doesn't want to answer the question. I mean, this has been asked t twice now, and he doesn't answer the question. Notice that. He asked me a question. This right here, are we saying that here's a person, uh, he says, uh, that actually steals from, from another uh, brother, and he says because in Matthew 18, when it says you go to that, go and tell your brother, he's saying that brother is now not saved. Well, it says you go and tell your brother, so when he stole, he's still his brother. He's still his brother. All right? But he, he says he's not saved. He says he's not saved. When it says he's his brother. Okay? And here, I don't know what he was saying. I mean, maybe it was because he got mixed up and he went to five. I'm serious about that. Um, the, the sons are chastened. He's a son that's chastened. So he's saying... Um, is not a, he says, no, he's not a saved person. He says, no, he's not a saved person. Well, it says he's a son, he's a child. So, his belief is, that in Hebrews 12, I think he was mixed up with, actually, number two, when he talked about going and, and, and telling a brother. I think he was, trying, was kind of putting those two together. But, in Hebrews chapter 12, we, we looked at this already. The person who's chastened is a brother. Unsaved people are not chastened. 
Okay? The, the, the ones that are not chastened are bastards. The people that are chastened, so the person has to be a saved person. He says he's not, even though Hebrews 12, 5 through 7 says that he is. So he's perverting scripture there. All who are justified also glorified. He goes back and says, well, look in verse 28. It says uh, they love God. Well, yes, yeah, saved people love God. Those that are born of God love God. We're going to look at that later on in 1 John 4. You read through 1 John 4, you see that. But he didn't still answer the question. Just because you go and create dust and a flurry of things, you still don't answer the question. I asked if the justified are glorified. He would not answer the question. It says there, point blank, the justified are glorified. Okay? Did Jesus ever do something not in the Father's will? We said yes. Well, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that later. I, I want to see him answer some of these other questions first, though. All right, go to, back to 2.16. 2.16. All right, I showed you Hebrews 10, 10 and 14. You know, he really still didn't deal with that. Let's go back to verse um, 14, 176. Go back to 176. Okay, so it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Those that are sanctified are perfected forever. All right? So that means once they're saved, they're always saved. Okay, the act of perfecting is completed at one point in the past with the results ongoing. Why well, one not at perfected forever them that are sanctified? The moment that they're sanctified, at that moment, they're perfected forever. Okay, did not, did, I, don't, I don't know, created a flurry, went back to verse 28, created a stir on things. I just want him to deal with that, not go all to different places and still not deal with the verse. I'm going to the verse saying, look, by one offering he hath perfected forever, forever, them that are sanctified. Not until you sin. It's forever. Your sins are taken care of in the future. Okay, and that's why we go back to, um, actually go back to 2.16 again. Okay, that's why we go to 1 John 1.5. Let's go back to, go to slide 134. Um, we, we said, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Go to 136. I want to go, go where we left off last time. Every person, regardless of his maturity or relationship with the Lord, is far from perfect by God's standard. We all have something in our lives that falls short of God's glory. Some sin, though it may be unknown. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says that. Okay, where then do we draw the line? Those who believe we can lose our salvation categorize sin as though God overlooks some sins while he judges others. It becomes a matter of degrees, and the question arises, how bad must we become before we lose our salvation? Which sin does us in? James 2.10 says that one sin is enough to condemn us. So if the works come in, you'll be condemned if you fail even one time. That's the thing with Galatians 5. If you're justified by works, you've fallen from grace. It's those that are justified by works that are fallen from grace. Justified by faith, and you're not fallen from grace. You can't fall from grace justified by faith. Okay? If we are condemned by one sin, then why is it that this person is still walking in the light? As he is in the light. Because we have an advocate with the Father. That's why we walk in the light. Because we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Alright, go to 2.17. The scriptural position is that justified, redeemed, saved people will not sin as a lifestyle continuously or as a practice. We were amazed when Mr. Hayfley put up a slide agreeing with this position. This made us wonder why he wouldn't just take the scriptural position, the one he proved himself. Let's see. Next. He, he quoted A.T. Robertson. Now this is from a later book of A.T. Robertson. The, the one that he had is not one that's easy, easy to get. This is one that's easy to get. But this is what he said, which was the same that he had on the chart. But you'll see the next chart. And this is Mr. Hayfley. He's made these same kind of quotes. Sinneth not. Linear present. Keeps on abiding. Active. Indicate of Hamartano. Does not keep on sinning. Whosoever sinneth, present, active, articular participle, the one who keeps on sinning, lives a life of sin, not mere occasional acts of sin. And then it says, hath not seen him. So the person who lives a lifestyle of sin has not seen him. It's not a one-time one sin. It's not occasional sinning. It's not, you know, as he said, characteristic or uncharacteristic. But 1 John 3, 9, doeth no sin. Linear, present, indicative, active. So it's not one sin. It's a practice of sinning. The person that, that practices sin hath not seen him, neither known him. They were never saved in the first place. That's the verse. He says, he hasn't shown me one place. That's the verse. I've already shown it. He doesn't deal with it. Next. 
All right, this is at this website right here, still there, so you can get it, quoting Brother Guy in Woods, he says, Mr. Hayfley online. The Apostle did not intend it for him that one who abides in Christ is not capable of committing a single act of sin. Such a concept would be in conflict with his affirmation of the universal prevalence of sin, even among the saints. Moreover, the designation of the means by which to overcome sin through the intercession of Christ implies its possibility. Thus, to teach it is possible, even probable, that one will attain to a life of sinlessness here is in conflict with his own teaching in the instances cons uh, cited and must not be attributed in here. In the passage, under consideration, the verb sinneth not is a translation of such harna, harna tenai, which is kind of a misspelling, but third um, consideration, the verb sinneth not is a translation of the... So it's, it's, it's continuous action. And this is one I want to draw your attention to because I don't want to just read this whole thing. You get the point. Continuous action. Mr. Hafley says himself, He who has taken up his abode in Christ and settled down to a permanent existence in him has terminated his former manner of life and has ceased the practices then characteristic of him. He no longer engages in habitual and persistent sin. That's from Mr. Hafley. He's the one that said that. So he's backing up our position and... I don't, want to, I don't want to be sarcastic here. This would be Hayfley like but this is what it would look like if I did it. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayfley, for that point. Okay, next. Uh, no, no, go farther. Go to the next one. 217. 217. Okay, we, we went through that one. Okay, go to uh, 182. No, no, no. 179. 179. Okay, here we go. Uh, no, I don't want that one. You're 222. I'm wasting my own time. 222. All right, good. The person who drinks of the water that Christ gives him in this lifetime will never thirst. In the Greek, a double negative makes this an emphatic. He will no not ever thirst. John 4, 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of the water shall thirst again. So, in other words, one time drink... Um, you have to keep drinking, drinking, drinking physically. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. That's an heiress. That's a one-time drink. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So shall no not ever thirst. Would someone thirst again if he drank the physical water? Yes. If that physical water didn't quench thirst, would someone need to keep drinking and drinking in order to quench the thirst? Yes. Would someone thirst again if he drank the water which Christ was offering? No. If someone would never thirst again upon one drink, would he need to keep drinking and drinking? No. So, and then at the bottom, screen's not holding it. Um, so what Jesus is saying is we'll never thirst again. We'll ne in other words, we have everlasting life. One time drink. This is consistent with everything that we'll see. Keep going to, after 2.20, 2.90. Okay. Uh, I think what we want to read here, look at 91 now. All right, now go back to 90, verse 39 I want to look at. just want to look at the text here. Um, verse 39 of John 6, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Of all, so let's go back to the argument 91. Okay? The Father has given the elect, those who will be saved, to the Son, and the results of that are ongoing. Hath given is perfect tense. All right, I want to go back to the perfect tense just to show this because we're going to hit this a bunch of times. Go back to 165. Okay, God gave scripture by inspiration, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. 2 Timothy 3.16, Matthew 5.18 says jots and tittles. Graphe in 3.16 shows it was the actual etchings, the writings that were actually inspired. But the New Testament was written in Greek. God wants us to understand his words based upon the language in which he was given them. 66. Okay, this is, okay, that's fine. Eris may be represented by a dot. Then presented, the, the present is by a line, and the perfect by a combination of the two. And so it happens at one point, it's completed, and the results continue on in the future. They're ongoing. Let's go to, now back to 91. Okay, so when Jesus gave, he gave and it was completed, and ongoing results. That's what all these verses say. I've got a hundred of them. I've got a hundred of them that say the same thing. So all of his, his if clauses and all that kind of stuff have to barge right through these verses. What, and remember at the beginning of my, of my speeches, I said, the Bible, you have to rightly divide. You have to look at it as a whole. It says this, that you're saved, you have it, it's completed, and the results are ongoing. All right? Some people out here are just, just muting it. They're just turning it off. They don't want to believe it. Just out of loyalty to something, I don't know. The giving of them precedes them coming to him. 
He is, it precedes them coming to him here. So the coming and the believing are the same thing. Those he has given to the Son are those who will believe. And you see that in John 10, 29. Uh, chosen through belief, based on the foreknowledge of God. Those who the Father gives the Son will keep on being His gift unconditionally. Now, Mr. Hafley might say, well, it was national election, it was election of a group. I showed you last night, Romans 16, 13, Rufus himself was chosen individually. So we've already dealt with that. So when he brings that up, you know, you can take it and do with it what you want with it. I also showed the elect sister, differentiated from different people that were saved. We showed you that. Okay, let's go back to 90, so we can look at verse 37. I know he wants me to be in the rebuttal tonight, but I'm in the affirmative. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. What does that sound like to you? I mean, the plain reading of Scripture. I will in no wise cast out. I mean, do you not want to believe that? Is that why you would say I'm not going to believe it? Because you just don't want to believe it? I will in no wise cast out. Let's go back to 91. Okay, all those who come to Jesus Christ, those who believe in Him and who have been given to Him by the Father will not in any circumstances be cast out from that position by the Lord Jesus Christ. No wise means not under any circumstances. No circumstances will result in casting out of the believer by the Lord Jesus Christ. His sinning is walk his attitude. That's why Jesus died to take care of our sins. He's not going to cast us out because He died for us. We believed in Him. Because we believe in Him, we have everlasting life. Okay, go back to, to 90. Okay, 39, again, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Go back to 91. Of all those given to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son by the Father, that is believers, or those who come to Christ, the Son will not lose a single one of them. Okay, go to, um, actually, 92. Go to 92. Okay, so this is verse 35, so go back to 91, yeah, 90. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now go back to that one, 92, 92. Okay, anyone who comes to Jesus Christ and believes in Jesus Christ will never hunger or thirst spiritually as it regards eternal life. Life speaks of spiritual life. The word for spiritual life or everlasting life is used here. The word never is the most emphatic negative in the Greek language. Communicate as strongly as possible. No room is left for spiritual hunger or thirst after someone has come and has believed. These verbs are present tense, of which there are many categories in the Greek, and these are descriptive presents. That is, they indicate what is now going on. The point of this present is to give the mind a picture of the events as in the process of occurrence. Okay? The idea is not believing and believing and believing any more than it is coming and coming and coming. The idea is that as soon as someone comes or believes, they will not ever hunger or thirst again. If you say you'll never hunger or thirst again, and by the way, this fits with John chapter 4, again, where it says drink, all right, you'll never thirst, you'll never hunger again. Okay, go back to 90 again. 39, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Look back at, at 92. Anyone who comes to Jesus Christ or believes in Jesus Christ, those whom the Father has given will be raised up again in the last day. His resurrection is guaranteed. No, be, not being cast out is the negative presentation of eternal security. Being raised up in the last day is the positive presentation of eternal security. So everlasting life begins the moment someone comes to Jesus Christ and believes on Him so that physical death cannot stop that from happening even as Jesus will raise up those whom the Father has given Him. Go to 101. Okay, actually go to 105 now. Okay, I wanted to deal with verse 24 of John 17. Knowing perfectly the will of God, Jesus prayed in verse 24 for the Father to have them be with him and behold his glory. Look, go back to verse uh, number 101. Okay, that's actually it's, um, it's 101. Okay, look at verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus here is praying that, that, that his, the saints, those that actually he gave to the Father, he did not give Judas to the Father. It never says it in there. The assumption is he didn't. Judas was actually elect actually the other direction. He was chosen the other direction in fulfillment of prophecy about Judas in the Old Testament. Judas wasn't going to be saved, okay? So, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. So Jesus is praying this. 
He prays in the Father's will. 1 John 5, 16 says that if you pray in the Father's will, he answers you. Jesus was in the Father's will. I showed you that the other night. That hadn't been answered yet. I'm not going to go over it again, but it hasn't been answered. All right? So, and he himself said that Jesus was in the will of God. Whether he says it or not, it doesn't matter. But 105 again. So, the, those that the Father has given the Son with the results of that giving ongoing, they keep being his gift. The Son asked the Father if the Father will let them be with Him when He's glorified. For this to be answered, for those that will believe in Him, they would have to be with Him in heaven. The ones whom the Father gives the Son will be with Him in heaven, because the Father will answer this prayer. Jesus, to, to, to say it's not so is to say the Father doesn't answer Jesus' prayer, does not actually answer that prayer. That would have to be your doctrine, which is blasphemous. To say that the Father is not going to answer the Son's prayer. I don't care if he says, well, some things aren't in the will of God. Certain people are not going to be there. Well, it is in the will of God to answer the Son's prayer. It's in the will of the Father to answer everybody's prayer who's in his will. Okay, is it his will? Yes, it is. So, let's go to uh, actually 100 again. Okay. Verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Go back to 105 again. Okay, knowing perfectly the will of God, Jesus prayed in verse 2 for the Father to have him give eternal life to them whom the Father had given him. This is a guarantee of eternal life to anyone that the Father has given him as a gift. A guarantee of eternal life. Okay, we can see here again the eternal life in this lifetime. It's in this lifetime because eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son. Verse 3, so you have eternal life when you know the Father and Son, which happens now, not just then. The glory that the Father has given the Son in verse 22, he has given those whom the Father has given to him, that they might be in him like he is in the Father, and the Father in him. The glory that the Father has given the Son, he has already given those that the Father has given him. Half given them is perfect 